In this fourth video, I'll be looking at some of the outcomes of different types of appointments. And I'm going to be starting with some summary statistics on the gender balance of different European judiciaries. I'm looking at gender first because it's easily comparable across countries in a way that maybe ethnicity isn't. And I'm looking at European judicial systems because there's a wonderful data source uh, from the organization CEPEJ, um, which stands for the Council of European something something judiciaries. Um, but most uh, European judicial systems are majority female. So I've got uh, on the horizontal axis the proportion of full-time judges that are male, and you'll see that the average, this red line here, is less than 50%. And you've got some judiciaries over on the left-hand side, which really are uh, female-dominated, just as we would say uh, the converse of judiciaries over to the right-hand side, where we would say that they are male-dominated. And generally, um, the more judges you have, the less male dominated the judiciary. So here we've got judges per 100,000 population. And over on the left hand side, we've got systems where there are relatively few judges per head of population. These tend to be the recognition judiciaries where there are a smaller number of high profile, high salary judges um, who you know, maybe progress more work or are more productive, but are still few in number. So got the UK over here with England and Wales, a couple of other uh, male dominated judiciaries uh, mentioned. The UK has a, a disproportionate number of male judges as do most countries at this end of the plot. And as we move down, as we recruit more and more judges per head of population, you know, the average number of female judges, the average proportion of female judges um, goes up just because the proportion of male judges goes down. So there are differences um, between countries in terms of the gender composition of their judiciary. Um, that was looking at Europe, but Valdini and Chartel in their 2016 article look at judges on apex courts worldwide. And they're testing this idea about sheltered versus exposed um, appointment methods. So they've got a sample of, of 50 democracies and they're controlling for a number of things like percentage Catholic and percentage female legislators and lawyers. You might think that uh, if there are more female legislators, those legislators might be more or less likely to appoint other women. And if there are more female lawyers, then you've got a broader pool of women to draw from. They test their claim using a regression model. A reminder, in case you haven't seen a regression model before, you've got a set of coefficients which show the change in the outcome. Given a change of one unit in the variable listed on the left hand side. So here we've got sheltered selection. That's a, a dummy variable or a zero one variable. So if we move from zero to one, if we flick this into the on position, then the proportion of women on the highest court or dependent variable or outcome variable goes down by roughly 17 percentage points. And that figure of 17 percentage points is large compared to the standard error or our measure of the uncertainty surrounding that number. Um, if you look at some of the other 
variables in the model, the percentage of women in the legislature has a positive coefficient. So I'm get for each percentage point more women in the legislature, you get half a percentage point increase on average in the proportion of women judges on the highest constitutional court. And apparently, you know, Catholicism is bad for female representation. There you go. So that uh, seems to be some indication that where appointment methods don't involve politicians, you get fewer women. Um, there's also evidence not looking at the proportion of female judges on top courts, but the time to appointment of the first female judge. Um, and similarly to Valdini and Shortell, they do find that exposed selectors go quicker, um, but they find that only in OECD countries. So um, there are a number of other control variables. Uh, so regional peer effects is basically the proportion of other apex courts in the region that have a woman judge. And then uh, things like the number of international NGOs which campaign for women's rights. So there are uh, studies which have good evidence in relation to the effects of type of appointment method on gender. If we go from gender to partisan activity, this is, is kind of hard, uh, in part because it's really difficult to compile comparative information on the proportion of judges who have ever been politicians. Uh, broadly speaking, there is this long term trend to fewer former politicians acting as judges. Now, even in systems where right now we think of judges as, as almost exclusively drawn from the ranks of lawyers and other judges, a you know, hundred years ago, there were lots of former parliamentarians on uh, the high court. And so uh, Harold Lasky writing in 1926, was talking about judicial appointment in the 19th century was saying that 80 out of roughly 140 judges appointed were members of the House of Commons, something that would be absolutely unthinkable now. I've looked at political appointment over that long, long period, just for England, uh, and I've asked whether the executive has a strong role in this, such that uh, judges would be promoted if they had a strong partisan identity or had been previously appointed by government of the same uh, party. I find that there's, there's no particular advantage um, to having the same partisan identity as a Lord Chancellor. So, so let's say a, a judge who is formerly an MP for the Labour Party or for the Conservative Party, that wouldn't help them. Um, but the judges, sorry, governments do have their favourites. So if you're appointed by a Labour government to the High Court, you're much more likely to be promoted to the Court of Appeal under a subsequent Labour government. And similarly, the other way around, if you're initially appointed by a Conservative government.